Tonight, I want to speak to you on the subject of five things you need to know about 666. And if you've never read the Bible, that number, as you're going to see in the 13th chapter of Revelation, is connected to the mark of the beast. And even if you've never read the Bible, Hollywood has had multiple movies that have dealt with uh, issues along these lines, most of them not theologically accurate, but the world knows enough about the Bible as to how to make movies and pique interest and put entertainment value around it. But what I'm talking about is not a fairy tale and not a Hollywood production. It is coming upon this earth in the very near future. Let's begin reading in Revelation chapter 13, because if you're a new believer, that's where we find reference to the mark of the beast. And by the way, Revelation is the last book in the Bible. And when I say it is the last book in the Bible, it is also referred to as a closed canon of Scripture, which means there are no new books. Revelation was the last authorized book of God placed into Holy Scripture. And listen carefully to what I'm about to say. All of those that you're listening to in social media who have revelations and things given to them by God and visions that they present as being equal to or greater than the Scripture, those are individuals that you need to delete from your list of trusted sources. They are unlettered and untrustworthy. The Bible and the Bible alone is God's eternal Word. Now, we believe in revelation. We believe in dreams. We believe in visions, but we never believe that they are co-equal to the integrity of the Bible. All of them are subservient to the Bible. For example, just recently, a major ministry that I'll not mention because I'm not God's defense attorney, but a major ministry in their social media has been doing this teaching that Isaiah chapter 63 was Isaiah prophesying that the FBI would raid Donald Trump's home in Florida. And as he perverted the Scripture, I never respond to these people. I, I just try it because it irritates me so badly. But I sat down and because I knew him, I wrote him an email. And I basically told him, I'll not tell you everything, but I said, what you are teaching is the worst perversion of the Scripture I have ever heard in 43 years of traveling the world. And if you continue to pervert the integrity of the Bible as clickbait, you will die prematurely, mark my words. You cannot take the Bible and use it for your own personal gain. You must strive for biblical integrity and biblical purity in all you do. So what I'm sharing with you tonight is straight out of the pages of the Bible. I'm not going to add to it. I'm not going to take away from it. I'm going to show you five things about 666 that you must know in these last days. Revelation 13, beginning to read at verse 11. Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. Pause right here. For those of you that are brand new Christians, in Revelation 13, if we read that chapter and that chapter in context, for the first time in human history, the revelation of what is called the unholy trinity will be revealed during the seven years of tribulation. The tribulation in the Bible begins in Revelation chapter 6, goes all the way through Revelation chapter 16. So by the time we get to Revelation 13 in John's vision, which is what the book of Revelation is, the vision given to John by Jesus Christ, the last days, all that is coming upon this earth, we now have for the first time in human history the revelation, the revealing, the unveiling of the unholy trinity. Now who is the unholy trinity? It's Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. They have never been revealed until the tribulation period to the world. 
but they will be on full display politically then, and we will then know, or the earth will then know, that politics has been puppeted by Satan for a long, long time. I'm not going to preach on it tonight. When you have an opportunity, listen to our teaching on the five political agendas of the last days. Because when you understand, and they're found also in Revelation 13, when you understand the unholy trinity, now listen carefully, the first beast is the Antichrist. The second beast in Revelation 13 is the false prophet, and the dragon is Satan himself. And the scripture actually tells us that. And the dragon, that old serpent, Satan. So these aren't guesses and speculations and a perversion of text. As we read through this, this is a foundation that I want the whole listening audience to understand. You are going to see the unholy trinity as I read, Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, they will then be in charge of five political agendas that are already working in our earth. And I'm not going to teach on that tonight. Listen to it on your own time when you have opportunity. I believe it's on all three channels. It's on the YouTube channel, it's on the podcast channel, and I believe it's in Facebook archives. But they are, number one, the Bible prophesied a one-world government with a one-world leader, a one-world monetary system, a one-world religion, and a one-world military power, power that will enforce it. That's why you're seeing the wheels fall off of our nation. Because by the time we get into the tribulation, the Bible said every nation will bow and become subservient to this global order. And as our president said days ago, that we now live in a seamless society and we need to be moving towards cooperative globalism and then said, and America should be leading the way to globalism. And so if you're wondering what's going on, and by the way, don't get upset with me. I hate politics. People say, well, you're a Democrat or you're a Republican. I need to know whether you can trust me. I'm a Christian and I believe in the Bible, and I believe, now don't get mad, I'm just being honest, I believe all politics are corrupt. I have no faith in either side of the aisle. I believe it's just two heads on the same snake because I know Bible prophecy. And in the last days, all politics in all nations is moving knowingly or unknowingly to the stage being set for the arrival of globalism and a one world leader. But the Bible said he cannot be revealed until that which hinders him is removed. And that is talking about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. And I want to live every day ready to meet the Lord. Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb. But he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all of the authority of the first beast and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast. All the earth and its people worship the first beast. There's your one world religion. Whose fatal wound had been healed. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to the earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived. Pause right there. Highlight the word in your Bible, deceived. Every time in the New Testament you see deceived, deceive, or deception. Highlight that, and I think you'll be astounded as to how much of final Bible prophecy and the 14 final major prophetic events, you'll find those words. Because that is the tool of Satan in the last days and the political agendas that are visible as I preach. Deception, lies, corruption, Mouth saying one thing, behind closed doors doing another thing. 
They are not looking out for your best interests. They are looking out for the interests of a global society, and you need to know that in the last days, only God can make America great again. Your hope should never be in a man or a politician or a political agenda or a political party because they are corrupted in the last days and moving towards the arrival of an antichrist, and your hope needs to be in the Lord and in the Lord alone. The psalmist said, I will lift up my eyes under the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. When he said, I'll lift my eyes up under the hills, he was talking about where the temple of God was, where the presence of God was. If there ever were a day and an age that you need to be faithful to the house of God, there is a supernatural covenant of divine protection, a fresh oil that rests upon those who continually are faithful to the house of God. That's why the author of the book of Hebrews said, as we approach the last days, we should be found in the house of God more often and not less often. Why? Because in the last days, your only hope is abiding in the covenant of God and the church is the visible tangible covenant of God whereby every Sunday morning God can look down from heaven and see who's playing first string on his team. Be faithful to the house of God. Verse 13, he did astounding miracles, making fire flash down to the earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all of the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belong to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to this statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. Pause again. You see, the more you understand eschatology, Bible prophecy, end time events, the more you'll understand when you see the news exactly what's going on. For example, I remember one night coming home from a long trip, sat down with my wife. She turned the news on later in the day. And as we were watching the news, we were interested because all of a sudden there was this demonic craze where young people were pulling statues off of their pedestals. Now, originally, they stated a reason for doing it, and then they abandoned all of the reasons for doing it and were just randomly pulling statues off of their bases. Now, you probably watched that and thought, isn't that disgusting? If you look through the eyes of eschatology, when I saw it, I thought, oh my goodness, is it possible? Because the Antichrist, just like all world dictators, study history, Almost all world dictators commission a major statue of themselves to be erected in the seat of authority where they rule. And they not only have that major statue, but they have hundreds and thousands of miniatures of those and pictures and art and so on throughout the kingdom where they rule. And I thought knowing what is coming on the face of the earth, is it possible that Satan is already beginning to clear the pedestals of the world, of all of the statues of history, getting ready to replace them with this coming Antichrist. Friend, this is a day and an age which you need to live every day ready to meet the Lord. Now, I hear a lot of preachers talking about there's going to be a great revival in America in the last days, but you can't support that with Bible prophecy. You need to hear what I'm about to say. You're not going to like it, but it's Bible anyway. Prayer doesn't change Bible prophecy. Prayer changes a lot of things, but the Bible said that the chart and the chronology of Bible prophecy has been established by the Father and is controlled by the Father only. For example, I've heard many major ministries 
who I think are over the line in their involvement in politics saying, well, we need to pray because if so-and-so is elected, it will give us a greater opportunity and a greater time to do the work of the Lord. Or if so-and-so is elected, the judgment of God will come, the windows of opportunity will close suddenly, we need to pray that that doesn't happen. Wrong on all accounts. God's in control of all elections. The Bible said in Romans, no one has authority unless the power of God grants it to them. And sometimes God allows leaders to bless a nation, and sometimes God allows wicked nations to hasten the promises of prophecy. So I'm not saying don't be involved in politics. I believe we as the church should occupy until he comes. I believe we should resist and fight every single inch of the way for what we believe in. But our fight should not be for politics as much as it should be for the fulfillment of the Great Commission because the authority of the church is so powerful that politics can't mess it up. When the church is operating in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, no man or woman in or out of office can stop what Jesus said. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So I believe in being a good citizen. I believe in being involved. I vote. My wife and I vote. We faithfully resist. We're doing everything in our power. But at the end of the day, I don't get discouraged over who's elected or not elected. I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my head. Can I hear a good amen? amen? So Jesus carefully told us, no man knows the day nor the hour. He said, my Father only. So don't miss this. The chronology of the 14 major prophetic events in the Bible are already set on a divine course. And you can't speed it up and you can't slow it down. Prayer doesn't change prophecy. You see, there's only two kinds of promises in the Bible. Conditional promises and unconditional promises. And unconditional promises are things that God has stated that are set in stone. And you can only choose to obey them and receive the benefits of obedience, or you can rebel against them and receive the consequences of disobedience. It's a message for another time, but it's important you understand that as I read on. Is it possible that the bases and the pedestals that once held the historic statues for decades, and many of them much longer than that, have been cleared for the arrival of somebody else, it may well be. Because it not only happened in America, it happened around the world. Verse 16, he required everyone. Highlight everyone. You don't have to go to seminary to figure that out. In the Greek, it means everyone. No exceptions. And then it goes on to further tighten it down so that there's no wiggle room. Everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. Now, some of you that have Bibles that are older than the 18th century, it may be translated and rendered from the Greek as in. I'll come back to that. There's a reason why all modern translations say on and not in. No one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Let's take a moment to pray. Now, Father, as we walk carefully through these five things that everyone needs to understand, about the mark of the beast and 666. I pray that your anointing, your wisdom, your knowledge, and your grace would guide my every word. And when I'm done and extend the invitation, I pray for every person listening, those that are present here in Wasilla, Alaska, and all who are watching online, live, all who will see or hear this message in the days and weeks and months ahead, 
I pray that all of them would be ready to meet the Lord. And so I ask for those who are not certain as to where they stand with God tonight, that by the Holy Spirit you would help them to know that God loves them, but He hates their sin, and that there would be a desire in their heart to turn from sin and turn to Christ. For the Bible says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so when that invitation to receive Christ is given, may they have the grace and the humility and the courage to say yes and to make salvation sure in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If you're taking notes, five things you need to know about the number 666. Number one, you need to have an understanding of, number one, the meaning of 666. The Bible says, let he that has wisdom understand 666. Now, I don't believe in speculation, and I really don't enjoy preachers and teachers who build messages around their ideas, their interpretations, and their possible speculations as to how things might be. I'm just old school, the way that I was raised, the way that I was educated. When the Bible says it, say it clearly and soundly and never apologize for it. But when the Bible does not provide detail, be honest enough to tell those who trust your ministry, the Bible does not give us enough data or clarification to be dogmatic and leave it at that. Because if God wanted it clear, He'll make it clear. There are certain things in prophecy that He intended to be a mystery. And so there are certain things about this that are mysterious. But there are also certain things about this that can be understood. For example, to understand 666, you have to have at least a fundamental understanding of biblical numerology. Now, I want to be very careful with that because there are a lot of people who say bib biblical numerology, and then they go through all of these theological gymnastics with mathematics and numbers, and they create stuff that is absolutely not biblical, trying to satisfy a narrative that they personally hold to. You can't be an extremist with numerology, but there are certain things about numerology that are clearly seen in the Bible. For example, the number seven in the Bible is always connected to God throughout the Scriptures, and it always represents perfection, wholeness, or completion. And it oftentimes is connected to things both physical or spiritual. In Hebrew, the number seven has the same consonants as the word for completeness or wholeness. Seven derives its meaning in the Bible from the story directly found in Genesis and creation. Because as we study the story of creation in Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, we read that on the seventh day, God rested. His work was complete, whole, and perfect. And the number seven is found over 700 times in the Bible, always meaning wholeness, completeness, and perfection. When we study the book of Revelation, the number seven is seen 54 times. When we read of God's wrath and judgment coming upon the ungodly world, during a time of testing called the tribulation period, a seven-year span of time that follows the rapture and precedes the second coming of Christ. We read about the judgments, and they're given to us in sevens, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, and we also have reference to seven thunders and so on. And so the Antichrist, the Bible tells us, comes claiming to be God, but indeed the Bible said his number is 666. If he were God, his number would have been 777. So by saying that his number is 666, 
Six in the Bible is always identified with man and the creation and not the creator. God the creator always connected with seven. Wholeness, completeness, perfection. But man in the creation story was created on the sixth day. And if we had time to dig deeper, we could walk through the scripture and see that the number six is always connected to carnality, to flesh, and to man. And most importantly, it is lesser than God. So when the Bible ascribes to him the number and the mark and 666, it is saying you will never be God, you will never be perfect, you will never be whole, you will never be complete. The wrath of God and carnality and judgment is already wrapped up in the character as to who you are, for you are indeed the political puppet of the dragon who is Satan. For this reason, the number 666 is a clear indication that the Antichrist is not God, but simply a fallen man pretending that he is God. Now, I'll not get into it for it's a study for another season, but I've always found it interesting that the name of Jesus in Greek is 888. If 777 is complete and whole and perfect, Jesus Christ alone holds the title of 888. But the Antichrist is lesser. So number one, he is a creation. He is not the creator. Number two, the mark of the beast. This is solid gold, and I know that I'm in Alaska when I say it. This is solid gold. Don't miss it. Number two, if you're taking notes, the mark of the beast is literal and visible. That's not a small thing. That is a massively, majorly important thing to know about the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is literal and visible. Now, look down at verse 16. The Bible says he will uh, give a mark, and the Bible says, given a mark on. Now, let me just take a moment to address that, and don't anyone get mad at me. I grew up on the King James Version of the Bible. I love it. I memorized probably close to 2,000 verses out of it throughout the entirety of my ministry. I am not bashing the King James Version, but because my target audience is unsafe people, unreached people, people around the world who don't understand the English language in many nations, obviously, I always want to offer a translation of the Bible. Number one, it must be accurate, and number two, it must be clear. That is the reason why oftentimes when I preach and teach, you'll hear me say, I'm reading tonight out of Revelation chapter 13, and I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Because when it was written among scholarship around the world, it was often said it is the easiest and most accurate Bible for a new believer or a seeker to read and to understand. So again, I love the King James Version. If you have one, you don't have to stone me after church. And secondly, you're not big enough. So I love the King James, but the King James was inconsistent in rendering the Greek text. I'm not faulting the scholars of the 18th century text. You have to understand that they had limited texts. They had less than 5,000 scrolls, manuscripts, bits, pieces, whereas modern scholars, because of time and archaeology and discovery, we now have well over 60,000 scrolls, manuscripts, bits, pieces, and so it really is an unfair fight in the translation process to expect the same level of consistency from the 18th century translators to modern translators. The word in the Greek, and I'm not going to bury you in a seminar of Greek and theology, but this is important. The word from the actual Greek text is epi, E-P-I, and it is always consistently translated on. Even in the King James, you'll find that in other passages, they translated it on. 
So some people, why would I take the time to explain this to you? Because there's a world of difference between the mark being in the skin or under the skin and being on the skin. The Bible properly translated and consistently interpreted renders it on. The mark will be given on or upon the right hand, on or upon the forehead. That is the correct translation and that is why all modern reputable translations of the Bible without exception translate verse 16 as on. Now, how does that relate in a practical way to you and I, Monday through Friday at our work day? It helps you to remember that the mark isn't hidden. It is not a chip injected under your skin. It is not an invisible mark put in the epidermis or etc. I hear all kinds of poor teaching by people who don't have proper scholarship leading people astray saying this is the mark of the beast but it's unseen or they're now using this technology in Sweden and it's under the skin and it's the mark of the beast and it's spreading throughout. No! It is literal and it is visible and the Bible said that it will be absolutely received as a pledge of allegiance to the Antichrist. Number three, the mark will be given as a sign of devotion to the Antichrist and a passport to engage in commerce. Bit of a lengthy sentence. Let me give it to you again. I see the majority of you taking notes. That makes me happy. Because let's be honest eschatology and Bible prophecy requires attention and requires intellectual and spiritual discipline. My wife often remembers me, Tiff, you need to remember that you've preached this stuff for over four decades of your life and for you it's like breathing in and out, but I have to say that as your wife, sometimes when I listen to you, it's like trying to get a sip of water out of a fire hydrant. Slow down. So occasionally as I'm preaching, I'll hear that in the back of my mind as I just did moments ago. And so let me slow down. Number three, the mark will be given as a sign of devotion to the Antichrist. I'll come back to that, but that's the primary reason. Not for commerce. The mark primarily is a sign of devotion to the Antichrist and as a passport to engage in commerce. Look at verse 12. Revelation 13, verse 12, he exercised all the authority of the first beast, and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. So if you're taking notes, be sure to put this down. The purpose of 666, the mark of the beast, is twofold. The purpose of 666, the mark of the beast, is twofold. Yes, number one, it is a mandated cashless economic system that will be brutally enforced. You won't have an option. There won't be quarantine for 14 days if you don't receive it. The Bible says people will be martyred and beheaded and killed who refuse it. I believe that's why Jesus said concerning this time, woe unto nursing mothers. Because a lot of people say, well, if I miss the rapture, if I continue to live in sin, or I know enough about the Bible that if I miss the rapture, I'll come back to Christ during the tribulation. Oh, really? You didn't have the backbone to serve Christ during this season, but you're suddenly going to be Superman during the tribulation period? Let me tell you now, if your knees are wavering now, they will be on the ground and dysfunctional then. Jesus said, woe unto nursing mothers. Why? Is it possible that this wicked regime, because if you can't buy or sell, eventually you can't feed your baby. 
and your milk dries up. And a mother may have grown up in church and know that if I take the mark, it is eternal damnation. I will never take the mark. And then she has to start listening to the dream of her life, that precious little baby. For several nights, it's unbearable crying. And then it turns into 24 hours a day of screaming. And then she begins to see the transformation as the belly begins to distend. And there's no food. And she can't buy. And she can't sell. And now she has to make two choices. Do I allow my baby to starve to death for the salvation of my soul or do I take the mark and save my baby? And I think we know what most nurturing, loving mothers will probably end up doing. Jesus said, woe unto nursing mothers. We can only imagine what will happen. So the mark of the beast twofold. First, yes, it is a mandated cashless economic system that will be severely enforced. But secondly, and more importantly, don't miss this, it is a permanent and visible sign that you have personally and publicly pledged your life and total allegiance to the global control of the Antichrist and have willingly received his mark of ownership and control. I will. And this is important. It is a permanent and visible sign that you have pledged your life and total allegiance to the global control of the Antichrist and have willingly, willingly received his mark of ownership and control. Let me give you an analogy that will make it even clearer. How did Jesus describe that to become his disciple, you receive salvation. You had to make a personal and a public choice. He said in Luke chapter 12, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father which is in heaven. Everybody Jesus called in the New Testament, he called personally and publicly. The mark of the beast will be a counterfeit perversion of salvation because now he will require you to do exactly what Jesus said with perverted consequence. You'll have to pledge your allegiance and worship him as God and surrender control of your life by personally and publicly receiving his mark. Number four, the mark of the beast, 666, will not be revealed until halfway through the tribulation. This is another absolute solid gold piece of the biblical equation that you must never forget. And you'll soon understand why because I'll explain it. Number four, 666, the mark of the beast will not be revealed until halfway through the tribulation. Now, I want to be humble enough to say that there are some people in eschatology that disagree on certain chronologies. But I firmly believe that the next major event is the rapture of the church. Uh, I'll not mention a name because most of you would know him, and it wouldn't be a critical uh, thing to be said, but there's a very famous ministry that recently wrote a book that has swept the church like wildfire, saying that the church is going through the tribulation. And uh, this notable ministry, and I've met him before, and he's born again, and he's a brother. You know, we have to have grace in realizing that when people have disagreements on secondary doctrinal issues, there needs to be a grace extended, and it doesn't mean that they're the devil, as most people attack one another in social media, that disagree with one little letter of doctrine, they attack them as if they're the Antichrist. Listen to what I'm about to say. In secondary matters of doctrine, 
For example, not everybody agrees exactly on healing. Not everybody agrees exactly on the evidence of speaking in tongues. Not everybody agrees on the chronology of Bible prophecy and so on. But these are secondary doctrinal issues. They are not connected to your salvation. And when it comes to salvation, in Christ alone, by faith alone, through grace alone, that is a primary doctrine and a hill upon which we die. We do not allow for any gospel or any truth or any variance that salvation is through Christ alone, by faith alone, through grace alone. But when it comes to secondary issues, we need to extend grace and be compassionate. Intelligent people are not afraid of healthy debate. So when you see people attacking people on the internet, that's how you know the IQ is lower than the room temperature. I wish that weren't true, but God knows it is. Intelligent people will allow for healthy debate without feeling threatened and insecure. But let me just very quickly give you a strong reason. And by the way, if you have a desire to study this in depth, I have only God knows how many hours of teaching available that answer specific questions. So I can't cover everything in one session. But as we're coming to the end of our time together tonight, let me tell you why I believe the rapture is the next major event and the church does not go through the tribulation. It is oftentimes called the pre-millennial view of eschatology, which I solidly believe in and have 50, in my life notes, 50 theological, biblical supported arguments as to why I believe the weight of biblical scholarship rests upon the church is not going through the tribulation. First, the church is mentioned 19 times in the book of Revelation in the first three chapters. 19 times from the Greek, ekklesia, you'll find in chapters 1, 2, and 3. After Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22, the church is never mentioned again in the entire book of Revelation until the closing remarks. If the church were going through the tribulation, which begins in Revelation 6, goes through Revelation chapter 16, how do you explain that there's not one single reference to the church in the entirety of those chapters? People say, well, it's found there in Revelation chapter 7. No, those are the tribulation saints. The Bible is very clear that those who reject the mark of the beast and trust in Christ during the tribulation will be saved, and those are tribulation saints. But it doesn't use the word in the Greek, ekklesia. The church is gone. And how do I know it's gone? Because Jesus said it would be gone. Jesus himself said in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10, as he's concluding his letters to the seven churches, don't miss this, those are both literal letters to literal churches, but they are also prophetic letters to the chronology of the church age. What's the church age? The church age was conceived at the first advent of Christ. It was then inaugurated in the upper room in the book of Acts, and it ends at the rapture of the church. You and I are currently living in the church age. But the Bible says the Antichrist cannot be revealed until that which hinders him is taken out of the way. What is the power in the earth that is hindering the arrival of this wicked global system? It is the Spirit-filled church. Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church age is guaranteed to thrive and flourish as it remains in the covenant of the Great Commission and in the covenant of the church age until the rapture of the church. And so Jesus said in Revelation 3.10 as he's wrapping up his remarks to the seven churches, 
because you've been obedient and because you've persevered, I will keep you from this hour of testing that is coming upon the whole earth. I will keep you from this great hour of testing that's coming upon the whole earth. Speaking to the church, he didn't say, I'll keep you in it. He didn't say, I'll keep you during it. He didn't say, I'll keep you through it. I'll keep you from it. And Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 is the rapture of the church. I heard the sound of a great trumpet. John's giving his description as Paul the apostle gave his description, but the pillar pieces of doctrine are identical. Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5 take us into the setup of the great tribulation period. That begins in chapter 6, goes through chapter 16. Now don't miss this. Jesus said, I'm coming for a bride that's pure, spotless, without blemish, without wrinkle. If the church were going through the tribulation, he'd be coming for a bride that was beaten, bruised, bloody, and beheaded. To even begin to think that Christ who died on the cross, God gave his only son to purchase the church and redeem us would then take us through the worst judgment and wrath the world has ever seen? Either the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from coming judgment or it has not. Now, just one more thing before I close and get to this last point. Don't miss this. What you'll often hear, I actually bought the book and read it even though I don't believe it because I believe in healthy debate. But I was actually disappointed at the poor scholarship. For example, this is always the argument that comes up with people who believe the church is going through the tribulation. Sooner or later, here's what you're going to hear them say. How convenient for the American church living in the lap of American luxury, knows nothing about persecution, to say that the church will never go through the tribulation when around the world Christians are being mutilated and tortured and beheaded and burned alive, and they'll go through that. And then they'll oftentimes take you to John chapter 16 and verse 33, where the Bible said, In this world you shall have tribulation." But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Jesus didn't promise us a walk free from tribulation. He promised us an overcoming victory throughout it. Now, if no one's ever explained that to you, you'd have to just kind of throw your hands up and say, well, good point. So what's the answer to that? Actually, it's quite simple. There is a world of difference between the tribulation of John 16, 33 in this world ye shall have tribulation. Notice that Jesus put the timing of that currently in force. Tribulation was already in the world. The tribulation and revelation has not yet come. But listen carefully. I'm not denying that Christians haven't been persecuted. I've preached the gospel in 56 countries of the world, most of them persecuted Christians. The last trip I was on prior to COVID, I was interrogated. I ministered in one village and the stones were flying when we got in the vehicle to leave that particular village. I wasn't hit. The car that I was in was hit. One of the preachers took one glancing off his shoulder. That's what he got for not keeping up with me. <laughs> run fast, brother, run fast. We weren't running. We just didn't expect it. We were actually just getting in the vehicle and uh, the stones began to pelt. So I understand persecution in the church. Don't miss this. All of the persecution in the church age has had three common denominators. Number one, it's always been regional. It's always been carried out in different regions of the world. Number two, it's always been connected to ethos in the Greek or ethnicity certain ethnic groups that have been persecuted. Christians in Muslim nations, you could go on down the list, but it's always been connected to ethnicity. 
Number one, it's been regional. Number two, it's been focused upon various ethnic groups. And then number three, and most importantly, don't miss this, it's always been carried out by the hands of men. But the tribulation in the book of Revelation that John spoke about will not be regional, it'll be global. It'll not be carried out against ethnic groups. The Bible said every tribe, every nation, every tongue. It'll be upon all people. Are you still with me? Can I hear a good amen? amen. Not regional, global. Not ethos or ethnicity, all people. And not carried out by the hands of men, but carried out by the hands of God. And so there's where the scholarship falls apart, is they forget to decipher the Greek and notice that the tribulation that is in the church age, don't miss this, the Bible said in the last days perilous times would come. How many know we're seeing perilous times in America? But it's not as perilous as many other nations. What we went through was not as perilous as our neighbors to the north in Canada. What Canada went through was not as perilous as it was in Australia. What Australia went through and is still going through was not as perilous as China, where they literally welded people into their houses. How many have ever seen those millions of people in major cities, <clears throat> major, major cities in China welded into their homes, hanging out their windows and screaming? It's like hell. Google it. Don't miss this. Here it is. The more perilous the location and the geography of where you live, the more perilous times will be. In other words, the more wicked the nation you live in, the more wickedness will be seen. The more wicked the nation that you live in, the more perilous times will become. So that's what we're seeing in our world today. But friends, it is nothing like the seven years of tribulation that's coming upon this earth. The number 666, the mark of the beast, will not be revealed until after the first half of the tribulation. Now, here's another point that's very important to know because people say, no man knows the day nor the hour that the Son of Man will return. You Christians believe in two second comings. You believe in the rapture and you believe in the second coming. There's not two second comings in the Bible. And some go as far as to say, there's no rapture in the Bible. Pardon me? There's seven raptures in the Bible. And Jesus was one of them. While he stood there, while they gazed upon him, he ascended into heaven suddenly. The angel said, this same Jesus that ascended, you'll see him in like manner also return. Over 400 times in the Bible were promised his return. So friend, I love this and I hope it will bring hope to your heart. Because we know the exact day that the tribulation begins, Daniel 9, 27, the exact day the tribulation begins is when the Antichrist sits down in Jerusalem and signs the peace treaty with Israel. Daniel 9, 27, that's the exact day of the tribulation when it begins. Then we know the exact day of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because both Daniel and John taught us that the tribulation is seven years in duration to the day, not by our calendar of 365 days, but by the Jewish calendar of 360. So because both Daniel and Revelation confirmed to us that the tribulation is seven years exactly, because we know the exact day that the tribulation begins, when the Antichrist touches pen to paper in the treaty, you can multiply seven times 360, and that'll be the exact day that the second coming of Jesus occurs. And the Bible says that he'll destroy them by the breath of his mouth, his spiritual authority, his feet will touch the Mount of Olives that will split in two pieces. So if there really is a second coming that no man knows the day nor the hour, and there is no rapture, then how do you explain that we know exactly the day of both the beginning of the tribulation, the end of the tribulation, and the second coming of Christ? We do not believe in two second comings because the rapture is not a coming. It is Christ coming for the church, but the Bible says we in the twinkling of an eye are taken to be in clouds of glory with him in the air. Christ doesn't touch the earth. He doesn't 
come to the earth. He simply comes to take the believers by means of the supernatural rapture. We believe in one second coming in two distinct phases. The rapture is Christ coming for the church. The second coming is Christ returning with the church where we will rule and reign with him forever. And the Bible tells us in Revelation 13 that he doesn't even reveal the mark until he breaks the treaty of peace with Israel at three and a half years in. Are you still with me? Let me wrap this up and we pray. I know this is a lot of information, but it's very important because a lot of people have become depressed and discouraged and suicidal because preachers have taught them and ministers and evangelical teachers that the vaccine was the mark of the beast, and it's just incredibly poor, unlettered scholarship. So I want to give you the greatest news of the night. Are you ready for it? There is absolutely nothing. Still with me? There is absolutely nothing. A born-again believer, a true born-again believer, repented of sin, received Christ, ready, living holy, living in the covenant of God, living in victory over sin. There is absolutely nothing as a believer that you can do to ever receive the mark of the beast. You cannot do it. It will not be available during the church age. It's not even available in the first half of the tribulation. The chronology, which is why I've taken the time to put some meat on the bone tonight. You can never take the mark of the beast if you're right with Christ. It'll never be available in the church age. It'll never be available when the authority of the church is still on this earth. It'll never be available as long as the promise of Christ to build the church continues. We win. We move forward in victory and we will return to rule and to reign. We will never be exposed to the deception of the Antichrist. Now with that said, I have absolutely no doubt that we're watching modern technologies that are a part and the process of the evolution of what's leading to it. But the mark of the beast, Jesus won't even allow it to be unleashed until halfway through. So when you see that Amazon has recently made available to certain markets the technology that you can now wave your right hand in front of your iPad or your phone and have your hand connected to your bank account and make purchases simply by waving your right hand. If somebody hasn't taught you this, a lot of people, I ain't taking that, that's the mark of the beast. No, it's not. It's just technology headed in that direction. I don't know if you have Whole Foods in Alaska, but in the lower 48, Whole Foods just came up with the technology in their grocery store where you can sign up, and all you have to do is take your right hand and put it over a scanner as you exit, and everything's taken care of. So we're seeing technologies that look like the mark of the beast. But I repeat, no born-again believer will ever have an opportunity to take the mark of the beast that's why I'm so passionate about preaching the Bible clearly and carefully because this is not sermonettes for Christianettes who've got to get home to their dinette sets and watch their TV sets and smoke their cigarettes. This is Bible truth that'll keep you under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Give Jesus a mighty hand of praise. Number five, and this is brief because the Bible says it, it doesn't need my commentary. Number five, all who take the mark during the tribulation are eternally damned. Once you take the mark, there's no salvation. There's no forgiveness. There's no rehabilitation. There's no second chance. The mark is your personal, visible, public, permanent allegiance that you rejected Jesus Christ and you received Antichrist. Well, where in the Bible does it say that? Revelation 14, turn over one chapter. 
Revelation 14, look at verses 9 and 10, and we pray. Then a third angel followed them, shouting, Anyone who worships the beast and his statue, or who accepts his mark on the forehead or on the hand, must drink the wine of God's anger. Must. Must drink the wine of God's anger. That's judgment. It has been poured full strength into God's cup of wrath, and they will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. That, my friend, is hell, and it's eternal. All who receive the mark halfway through the tribulation have sealed their eternal damnation. I close with this statement, and we pray. Every person within the sound of my voice, you will either, in your lifetime, you will reject Jesus Christ on this side of the rapture. You'll either reject Jesus Christ and be left with one option, to receive the Antichrist and his mark. Or you can reject the Antichrist tonight and receive Jesus Christ in his mercy. Now, friend, if you've listened to anything that I've said tonight, and how many of you know I started in the Bible, stayed in the Bible, and finished in the Bible? If there's only one thing you walk away with tonight, let it be this. Receive Jesus Christ in his mercy, and you'll never have to worry about receiving the Antichrist in his mark. Receive Jesus Christ in his mercy, and that will assure you you'll never have to deal with receiving the Antichrist and his mark. And everybody who wants to live ready to meet the Lord and believes and receives the word of God preached tonight, give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. I told you I'd be done tonight by 8. Let the record show I'm a minute early. Tomorrow night and Wednesday night, the services start at 7. I'll be done before 9. The services will not be lengthy, but I make no apology for taking people into the depth of the only thing that will save them in the last days. People need to know what the Bible says, for it is the blessed hope of the church. Can I hear a good amen? Would you stand to your feet with me, please? As much as is possible, I'd like for you to be steady. What we're about to do is the most important thing that we do at the end of every night. I want to give you an opportunity to pray with me. Because some of you, if you'd be honest with yourself and honest with God, you're not ready to meet the Lord. You're not living a holy life. It concerns me the words of Jesus in Matthew 7 where Jesus said, The road that leads to heaven is straight and narrow and few there be that find it. You'd hear some preachers preach today and you'd think that 95% of everybody's going to heaven and only, you know, murderers, and rapists, and pedophiles are going to hell. But the Bible said the road that leads to heaven is straight and narrow and few there be that find it. So let me give you a Christianity exam before you go. Because people say, Tiff, is there, is there a way that I can really test to see? Well, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth. He said, examine yourselves to see if your faith is really true. So let me give you just a simple four-question test. And you can grade your own test when we're done. And I'm not giving this to judge you or to make life difficult. I want you to evaluate, examine yourself. Because as I say all the time, if you're the worst sinner in Alaska listening to me right now, I'm your best friend. I just love you enough to look you in the eyes and tell you the truth. Question number one, do you read your Bible every day? Because Jesus said, here's how I'll know my real disciples in that they continue in my word. Do you read your Bible every day? You can't live a Christian life without this. Even in the Old Testament, the psalmist David said in Psalm 119, Thy word have I hid in my heart, 
that I might not sin against thee. No, nobody, none of us have the willpower to live a Christian life. That's why he gave us a supernatural power. Number two, do you pray every day? Jesus said we should always pray and not faint. People faint and fall by the wayside because they quit praying. The Bible said, in all of your ways, acknowledge me and I'll direct your path. You should pray every day and you should pray about everything. If it's of importance to you, it's of importance to God. You don't have to be in a church building in a suit in a room with stained glass windows to pray. I pray way more in jeans than I pray in suits. But talk to God every day about it all. To throw a little Clint Eastwood into the mix, pray about it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Number three, are you faithful to the house of God? It's one of the Ten Commandments in the Old Covenant, let alone in the New Covenant. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now there's great debate on Saturday and Sunday, and if you really want to get into a great intellectual Bible study on that, Go listen to our Bible study about the Sabbath. And you'll find that the Bible said that God's not legalistic about the day, but He is very structured about the relationship. Do you set one day a week aside minimum to be found in the house of God? I don't go to church because I love my pastor, but I love my pastor. He's one of my best friends. Last time we were together, we prayed together, and he said, Tiff, the Lord's made it clear that in the last days, I'm supposed to stay connected to your ministry. I said, you're already connected to me. I love you. You're my pastor. I don't go to church because I love the worship team, although I think we have one of the finest worship teams in my home church. Powerfully anointed people, graduates of North Point Bible College and graduate school. I love them. I love my church, but that's not why I go. I go because I'm in covenant with God. And every Sunday morning when I go to the house of God and I take my tithe and my offering and whatever else God lays upon my heart, it's me telling God, you've been so good to me. How could I ever do anything but serve you, praise you, honor you, worship you? and do it in a practical way. Even if my flight gets in at 12.30, 1 o'clock, delayed, ask my wife. I'll be up, showered, shaved, and in the house of God. Number four, are you trying to win people to Christ? It's impossible to have a relationship with God and know eternity and coming judgment and not have an urgency in your heart about your family your husband, your wife, your sons, your daughters, your grandkids. Are you making an effort? Is that a part of your prayers every day? Do you witness to your co-workers? And I'm not, you know, you have to be careful. You don't have to shove God down their throat every working hour. You're paid to work, not to witness. But when you get an opportunity and God opens a door, do you take advantage of it? Everywhere I go, I try to leave at least a seat. Young girl that cuts my hair, I pray for her all the time. I talk to her about the Lord. I tell her that, because I know what she's gone through. I tell her that God loves her. I got her a Bible. I tell her I'm praying for her. She's starting to come around a little bit. Everywhere you go, be an ambassador for the King of Kings. The famous Christian author A.W. Tozer said there's only two kinds of Christians, soul winners and backsliders. How can you know Jesus? How can you know what he did on the cross? How can you read this word and not care about other people? You may not be successful and be a great missionary or lead thousands to Christ, but everywhere you go, you should be an ambassador for the Lord. 
And that's why you need to know the Word of God in your heart because your conversations and your debates will never lead anybody to Christ. But the grace of sharing the Word of God in a broken soul is seed and fertile ground, and you can pray over it. And listen, before you talk to people about God, talk to God about people. Pray for people. The Holy Spirit can do what we can't do. Now, with all of that said, some of you maybe didn't pass the test, and you need to come back to the Lord tonight. That's why when I give the invitation, as I'm going to do right now, I always say, some of you that will pray with me, it'll be the first time you've ever done this personally and publicly. But I also know that in the aftermath of what's gone on in recent years in our nation, that there are a lot of people that got out of church and got used to living without God, without the Word, without prayer, without one another. And sadly, they say that over 43% of those who left the church said they're never coming back. What a frightening decision. But I'm here to tell you, you can come home. If you lost your way, you can come home. Hosea chapter 14, verse 4, how I love that verse. I will love you freely, and I will heal your backsliding. I will love you freely, and I will heal your backsliding. So no judgment from this pulpit, just the Word of God and an invitation of grace. You can come home. No matter what you've been through, no matter what you've done, come home. Get back to an altar. And the Bible said, whoever conceals their sins will never prosper. But whoever renounces them and confesses them will receive mercy. The mercy flows rich and deep at the altars of the Lord. Come home tonight. So I'm going to kneel here as I always do in our Lost Lamb events. And I pray. People say, what do you do when you kneel? I pray for you. I pray that God will give people the courage and the humility to come and to receive salvation or to receive restoration. Christian, you know what I'm going to ask you to do? I've done it for over 20 years in Alaska. You should know by now. I'm going to ask you if you have a friend, a neighbor, a family member, someone next to you, and you're not sure if they've ever made, listen, you're not sure if they've ever made their own personal and public decision to Christ, not forcibly, not arrogantly, but in a Christ-like manner, as people are coming, you turn to them and say, I'll walk with you. By coming to this altar, you're saying, I'm willing to repent of sin. By coming to this altar, you're saying to Jesus, I receive you and I reject the Antichrist. I receive the mercy of the Lord and I reject the mark of the tribulation. By coming to this altar, you're saying, I receive salvation. By coming to this altar, you're saying, I will live for Jesus Christ under the coming of the Lord. By coming to this altar, you're saying, I want to be a real Christian. By coming to this altar, you're saying, Father, I'm coming home tonight just as I am, and he'll take you and he'll forgive you. As the worship team leads in a song of invitation, as you feel the tug of the Holy Spirit, you come now and then we'll pray together. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are We're going to pray with these that are at the altar. And those of you that might be watching online, wherever you might be, you can pray too.
you can come home to. You can make peace with God, and we want you to pray with us. This is very important for those of you that are watching online. If you live anywhere in Alaska, when we're done praying, go to KC Alaska and connect with this church, and they'll follow up on you, help you, provide spiritual mentorship, comfort, prayer. If you're anywhere else in the world, go to lostlamb.org, that's our ministry, and click on New Beginnings, and then just follow the prompts. It walks you right through it as simple as ABC. And connect with me. Everybody's somebody to Jesus, and you're important to me. And we want to help you and minister to you. Wherever you're at, pray this with me from your heart. Just say, Heavenly Father, tonight as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. In these last days, I choose Jesus. I choose the mercies of the Lord. I choose salvation and forgiveness. Tonight at this altar, I recognize my sin and I repent. In childlike faith, I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus. With the blood you shed upon the cross, cleanse my mind, my body and spirit, and make me holy in your eyes. I vow this night, I will serve the Lord. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me your power to be what I ought to be. Now according to the Bible, which cannot lie, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Tonight I'm saved. I am no longer the property of sin. I am right now a child of God, and I'll never be the same. Use me to reach my loved ones and all who come in contact with my life and example. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give Jesus a mighty hand of praise. If you prayed to receive Christ, won't you let us know? We'd love to help you grow in the things of God. Text us at 907-357-2065. You can see the number on your screen and text SAVED and we'll help you grow in the things of God. God bless you and remember, God's on the throne and the devil's been defeated. Peace.